because um, today we're going to talk about a subject that Charlie wrote an article about. And when he used to live in Silver Spring, remember he used to write, uh, send out in the email drush every now and then. And then on this parsha, he wrote a nice article called, uh, and now we're going to start the presentation. What's at stake? Understanding the prohibition of leaving a corpse on the stake. And uh, so I'm going to expand on uh, the different commentaries that he brought in that article. And so let's start with the main verse in our parsha. Uh, there's a short verse. Uh, so is there a volunteer to read the Hebrew? Anyone want to? I'll, all right, I'll. Uh, uh, okay. Oye, the ish, chait, mishpat, moves, who mos. It's blocked. Wait a minute. I can't. Uh, but the tohalita also al eights. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. Low, halin. Nivlaso al ha'etz. Ah, no, okay. okay. He, I even I understood that. Ki uh ki kavor ki ki baruni barunu v'yom hahu. In red, ki ka kilat Elohim talu. Okay, excellent. So thank you, Bill. And the English reads. Let's have a volunteer. Can we have a volunteer to read the English? Okay. If a man is guilty of a capital offense and is put to death, and you hang or impale him on a tree, you must not let his corpse remain on the tree overnight, but must bury him the same day. For a hanged body is the cursing of God. You shall not defile the land that Adonai, your God, is giving you to possess. Thank you, Nali. So as you see in red, the, what's the reason that we can't allow the... So th first of all, let's get, be clear. He wasn't hanged as... the That wasn't the form of punishment. After he was executed by other modes of execution, then the Torah says, well, you should, there's a point in publicly displaying his body, I guess for deterrence, but then there's a restriction on that. You can't do it more than just one day. So at, at, in the evening, you have to take the body down and bury it, in the, bury it in the ground, give it proper burial. And then the Torah gives the reason for a hanged body is the cursing of God. So let's first of all see, this is not just a theoretical law, it was apl applied uh, just when they uh, entered Israel. Joshua applied this law when he fought the Canaanite kings and he uh, captured them and executed them, five Canaanite kings. And then in the book of Joshua, it says, after that, Joshua had them, do you see this, what, what I'm reading yes. now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Joshua had put them to death and their bodies hanged on five stakes and they remained hanged on the stakes until evening. At sunset, here comes the punchline, Joshua ordered them taken down from the poles and thrown into the cave. So it's an important uh, prohibition that even when you're with non-Jews or the enemies, you have to still follow it with your enemies' bodies. You have to respect their bodies and not let them hang more than one day. So now that we have that, that this was actually uh, performed and, and uh, uh, we have a story with it, let's, let's, let's look at the theory of why. What does it mean? He kelelat Elohim talui. If we break it down, kelala is a curse. Elohim, what is Elohim? Well, you all say, well, that's God. Well, not, don't be so sure. It could also mean a different meaning. We'll get to that. And talui, talui is hanged. So if we put these words together, is it, what is this curse? Is it a curse from God? Is it a curse of God? Did, did maybe that person cursed God? Um, and what kind of curse? What, what is the nature of this curse? 
that it is the reason why you have to bury him and not let him remain there hanging on the stake. So let's first uh, deal with the Christians, what they did with this verse. The Septuagint, uh, the Greek Jewish translation, translates it, for anyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed by God. So they understand it as a curse from God on the body. The body itself is cursed. And this led the disciple Paul in the New Testament, they give this whole explanation for the crucifixion. And I'm quoting from Galatians, Yoshke redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. So look what they do. They take this verse, and they give this as a basis for this whole idea of, of crucifixion. God cursed the body, and he took the curse upon him, and that's why we are all uh, saved, right? That's how the uh, basic or important theology in, in, in Christianity. And if we move forward to the other Christian translations, the Vulgata, which is the Latin translation and, and the basis of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we have there, for a curse of God is one who hangs on a tree. And then the King James, the one that you find in every hotel room, you know, the Bible that is, is in every hotel room in America, for he that is hanged is a curse of God, very similar. And we can't deal with translations without giving honor to Neve, right? The new international version. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to look at that really. we have to we must <laughs> uh, uh, since Steve comes here every week so they a little bit more modern way but saying the same idea because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse okay so now that we got that out of the way it's not the shot it's not it doesn't seem like uh, the body itself is cursed the curse must be doing something else the curse must be a reason that it has to be taken down um, but when we start going to Jewish commentators, medieval commentators, of course they didn't go along with this whole crucifixion business. Uh, but they did take this idea of a curse coming from God. And here's Ibn Ezra with the picture from uh, Wikipedia. I'll you know, take it with a grain of salt. The Pshat explanation is that God is the source of the curse which will come upon any place close to the hanged man. Oh. So, the, so very interesting. Still, the, the, the source is coming from God, it's, and not it's not that the body is cursed, the you know, like a, but the place, any place. So, so you don't want that place where he's hanging, and that fits in with the second half of the verse. If we go back, right, you should not defile the land. So, right, the, the continuation of that phrase talks about the land. So, the land that's near that that body that is hanging is being cursed, so you have to take it down, okay. And in the same form, we have another medieval commentator, Nachmanides Ramban. Let's read what he says. Nevertheless, do not leave his body hanging on a tree, for someone who is hanged is more accursed and degraded than anyone else. It would be shameful to make our holy land impure by bringing God's curse on it. So again, he understands Kilalat Elohim as Kilala from Elohim, from God, because it's so degrading, it's even more than just dying. It's being hanging there on the tree or on the stake. It's, it's so degrading. He uses the word bazui. It's bazui, and, and that will bring God's curse. Therefore, you have to bury it properly in the ground. Let's move on to a totally different explanation, even, I would say, counterintuitive. The Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin, Perak 6, chapter, uh, Mishnah 9, says, that who is hanged? The person who cursed God. That's the curse. The, the person oh, who cursed God, he got it. executed. So let's read it. Meaning, Klomar, why is this person's body hanged? Because he cursed God, thereby causing the name of heaven to be desecrated. So as you see, it's a totally different understanding of the phrase. And if we took the Mishnahs, uh, again, I don't think it's Peshat, but if we took them and we try to translate it, it would come out as, Hanged is the person who cursed God. So now that, now the, again, so it's very, very different, right? Not the curse coming from God, but the person, he cursed God, therefore he was hanged. And, uh, you know, that's why, but again, it doesn't explain why you have to take it down and bury it. Like what's wrong with him, like being left on the stake there? So the mission doesn't really help with that. So let's move on to the horse shore. 
I'm, she, Maya, he, I would love to go back to the translation because I was first under the impression that it was a curse to God, not curse from God. I thought that's how it translated. No. So every translation is an, every translation is an interpretation, right? Yes, if I look at that, absolutely. Right. So if we look at the if we just look at those four words, it's, these are four Hebrew words. He because I don't think there's any argument about that because. The kililat, a curse, and then Elohim. Oh, by the way, in grammar, we have a kililat uh, Elohim. So the, the taf there shows us that it's a construct or what we call smichut. So you are right in the sense, Jack, that the, in the Hebrew grammar, if you analyze it from a grammar point of view, it's, it's curse of God. Uh, but again, it could also mean curse from God. And talui is, is hanging it. Could it so, not mean that you're cursing God? That's what I was thinking. That you're cursing, that you, we are cursing God by this act. Oh, oh so, oh, that's a whole different, so we, oh, by leaving him there, oh, so we'll get to that. That's very interesting okay. what you're saying, Natalie. That, that's what that, I was saying. That, yeah, so we'll get to that in a second that we are we are sort of demeaning god if we do that if we let the body hang there we'll get to that but but first let's go to um a late 12th century the horse or he always had these uh, pretty original interpretations he says don't remind people of the cursing of god so he bases it on the mishnah right we talked about the mishnah says in sanhedrin that the whole curse business is the person he caught he cursed god therefore he got hanged or therefore his body is hanging and based on that, he says, don't leave any person hanging, lest onlookers say, this man was a blasphemer. He rebelled against God. This public reminder of the fact that the wrongdoer cursed God leads to the disgrace of God. And then he gives a mashal, a parable. I like parables, so I, I included it. A man slapped the king in the face, pulled out the hair of his head and beard. Even though the king had him hanged, it would further disgrace the king if news of the crime were to be publicized and people who saw the body displayed were to say, this is the man who once slapped the king. So uh, in his interpretation, we, we can't let this body hang to for too long. It's an insult to God because people say, oh, look, this, this person cursed God. And, you know, it's possible to curse God. Does that sound convincing to you? No. No, I, I agree. I don't think it's convincing. Because first of all, people don't need a reminder that you can curse God. They know every single day they can do that. People all, you know, people curse all the time. It's human nature. It's not, I don't think they need to be reminded of that. And also, I don't think God needs to be protected like his dignity, like God, like a king, right? The parable is not comparable to the, to the, to the verse, to the prohibition. A, a king, yeah, I can understand. He doesn't want this whole thing to be publicized that somebody, you know, disgraced him and pulled the, his hair from his head and beard. But God is not like that, right? God is, is, is not someone who has to defend his dignity, so to speak. So I, I am, think it's a weak explanation. Let's move on to Rabbi Meir in the Talmud. In Sanhedrin uh, 46b, gives another mashal. And as you see in the picture, it has to do with twins. So let's read it. It's a fascinating mashal. It was taught. Rabbi Meir offered the following parable. To what may this case be compared? to a story about two twin brothers who lived in the same city. One became king, the other became a robber. The king commanded that he, the robber, be hanged. All onlookers who saw this said, look, the king has been hanged, right? Because they're twins. So the king commanded that his hanged brother be taken down. <gasps> Very interesting, Mashal. Who are the, who are the two twins? So now we go to Rashi. The twin brothers are God in, in the real prohibition in, in our verse, God and humans. We're both were created in the image of God. So when killing a human being, even if it's done according to the laws, even though he was, you know, properly executed according to he was a capital offense, etc., still the very fact that he's dead and hanging there, it's an affront to God. I think that's what you were referring to, uh, Natalie and Jack, right? Yes. Yeah. So just seeing that, just seeing a dead person, a, a, a person who once had God in him, who once had the image of God, or maybe we should say the image of God in him, now he's dead, that's an affront to God. So that's how they understand Kililat Elohim. 
Um, so, you know, there's a more, it's the same thing, but in a practical sense, especially in a, a climate like uh, uh, Israel or other warm climates, the body undergoes pretty gross changes after something like that. And um, I mean, that is truly um, now desecrating the image of God, not just the fact that it's dead, but that it's decomposing. It's decomposing, it's, it's mut it becomes mutilated yeah. Or, or yeah, yeah. Good animals, so, you know, right. animals come and-, and Right. So Bill, Bill has a comment. Yeah. Um, this reminds me of the other halacha where they talk about if a corpse is found outside a city or near a city, the responsibility of the authorities of the city to deal with it immediately. Right. And, and to, to remove the body and to, so this, to me, it ties in with the whole thing. Yeah. An affront. Yeah. A, yeah. a body, so, a body left unattended is an affront to Hashem. affront to God. And in yeah. a sense, this, this serves as uh, the basis to a very wrenching image in a famous, author, Elie Wiesel. Have you, are you familiar with his book, Night? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of you, some of you read it. Neve, did you read yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, have you got read it? Okay. So there in his book, there is an image there. There's a story or, and the Nazis hang a Jewish boy and everybody to see it and they leave his, his body there. And then the voice inside uh, the narrator says, where is he, God? Here he is. He is hanging here on the gallows. Uh, you know, very, very gut-wrenching uh, and moving reaction that, yeah, right there, there, there he is, God is hanging, because God, God is in the, the hanged body. And, and so I think that the, the, the Mishnah, the way Rabbi Meir explained it, and Rashi, you know, has this idea of, because we are creating the image of God, if you hang a person like that, then, so to speak, the Shekhinah is hanging also, and, and God is hanging there. Um, but it is a, it is a, um, it is, is definitely a more uplifting message to, to that, that even executed criminals, they still have that image of God in them and therefore you can't leave it there. You can't let it be mutilated. You can't let it be debased. It's God is still there. Uh, so now let's move on to his grandson. Rashbam, uh, was Rashi's grandson, uh, died 1160. And then 700 years later, Shadar, Shmuel David Luzzato, Italian, uh, 19th century, they come uh, from a very different angle. They come from left field, so to speak. Elohim does not mean God. You're all wrong. It means judges. And there are other places in the Torah where it seems clear that Elohim is used in the sense of judges or the justice system. And let's read what he says. Commonly, when people, either the relatives of a hanged person or others, see a person hanging, they curse the judges because sometimes a person is executed for a minor infraction like the gatherer of wood. Remember, we talked about that poor yeah. guy, the, the gatherer of the wood when nobody exactly knows what he did wrong. God has commanded us not to curse the judges because people commonly do curse them. <laughs> and that still, uh, I think, applies today. Uh, so when people lose, you know, in the court system, they usually go out and curse the judges. But uh, so he says, that's the reason. You don't want to keep it hanging there, the body hanging there, uh, because that will cause um, the basically it's, it causes people to be suspicious of the entire justice system. So here you see their pictures. I think you can tell easily who is Rashbam and who is Shmuel David Lutzato, mm. right? Who who lived 700 years later and who lived in the 12th century? I think it's very clear from the pictures. It. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, but both of them. That's what's interesting here. That that 700 years apart. They both like this idea that this is not talking about God or image of God or affront to God. No, this is talking about maintaining the integrity of the justice system and not having people curse it and, and trash it. And, and so to, to, uh, to prevent that, that's why we have this, this prohibition. Jam, uh, next, question. Uh, yeah. Um, I had always learned that uh, capital punishment was very rarely used by Jews on other Jews. And it, these quotes make it seem like it's commonplace. Uh, 
I, I don't think it's it's it, I don't think it's that common. I mean, I think it's I think it's just an extra prohibition. If you're already doing it, you have to make sure to uh, not leave the. In other words, it, it doesn't talk about the frequency of of the of when was capital punishment. And like I said at the beginning, this is uh, this is not about hanging as as a form of capital punishment. It's pretty clear from the verse he was executed by other means according to whatever rules there are and only right and only if you follow if all the laws and that's and that's where you're right that the um all the laws of capital punishment make it so hard to do it yeah. that it was pretty rare but yeah, in but the, in the, so in the rare case that it did happen and you still want to you know put it on display for deter for purposes of deterrence mm -hmm. then you have this prohibition this extra point that you have to make sure oh you have to take it down by sunset i have a i have a different view uh -huh. uh, Natalie's right. We learned about the rarity of the capital punishment, but that was capital an, a, a verdict issued by a religious court. And this is before. And the, and I can, from my reading of Jewish history, the kings and all that. They, if you want to call them the secular people, they they did use capital punishment. Mm. Uh, yes, as we saw, Joshua, right? He. Right. He executed rare, those, yes. those five kings, but then he made sure to take their bodies down. Well, yeah, but I, but Natalie's right, but it, but it, I think it only applied to a Sanhedrin or, or or other religious authorities. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. And this now also parallel about how forget about hanging. If a person dies in Jewish faith, you're supposed to bury them within a day, right? Yeah out of respect yes Is yes so um, yeah so uh let me refer again to something that charlie mentioned in his article um samson Raphael hirsch he expands on that idea of the dignity of the deceased and he ties it into this the same halacha that you mentioned jack of you have to bury it as soon as possible you know, sometimes you have to wait uh, one or two days especially if there's an overseas component but Yes, we have a principle in Israel. They actually do it almost on the same day. They they don't wait at all. They they uh, uh, if it's if it died on Shabbat, they 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 bury Musay Shabbat. You know, they, they don't even wait till Sunday. And this is all tied to the same idea. And and Hirsch, you know, the great German rabbi and commentator, he ties it into that and says, yes, this is all about uh, the, the dignity of the human body uh, created in the image of God. And so, as part of those laws, you can't leave him hanging there. Even if even if you were okay, to, you were allowed to hang him in the first place. But what, yeah, once once the sun sets, you have to take it down. So let's see if you were listening. This is like a test at the end of the uh, of the talk, right? So in our JPS translation, in our Red Chumash, this is how they translate "Kikirat Elohim Talui." For an impaled body is an affront to God. So which which commentator, which shita do they follow of the previous shita? So we had these two. Guys, the Rashbam and the Lutsato. Not those guys. And no, then we had earlier. Rashi. And yes, so you think Rashi. they are the Rashi. Yeah, yeah right. Yes, so, Rashi. Yeah, I think so too. I think our JPS translation follows this idea of um, killing a human or mutilating a body it was created in God's image as an affront to God. Yeah, and, and they use those words, affront um, to God. And uh, so that concludes uh, our our talk today. Okay. okay. All right. So let's let's read some Torah. We have, maybe we'll do ten minutes of Torah reading, quick Torah reading. Uh, and we'll actually read that verse because it's at the beginning of the parsha. So Neve, let's call up uh, people. Should I end the recording? Yeah. Ernie there? Yeah, Ernie's here. Oh, okay. Ernie, you ready? You got Aliyah? Yeah. Thank you.